you had come to me three years ago and told me that Half-Life would be getting a new sequel, I probably wouldn't have believed you, nor would I have believed you if you had said that it would be a VR exclusive title. When I started the game up and looked at the impressive view before me, I still had a bit of disbelief tugging on the back of my mind. Valve would never make a new game, there's too many memes saying they wouldn't. It wasn't until I threw a book at a cat basking in the sun and saw the insanely detailed animation that followed that I was able to accept that I was playing a new VR game with the polish and consistency that comes with Valve titles. But enough of me gushing over how good this game looks and how great all the character animations are, it's time for me to get into the real reason I wanted to make this video. Half-Life's head crabs have been one of the most iconic video game enemies since pretty much the start of video games. Half-Life 1 and 2 cemented them as terrifying enemies that want to do unspeakable things to you in order to turn you into a zombie, and then Half-Life Alex came along and made headcrabs cute. Because of that fact, I decided I wanted to challenge myself and see if I could beat Half-Life Alex without hurting a single headcrab. I would have made the challenge, can you beat Half-Life Alex without killing a single headcrab, but I don't know how the YouTube algorithm works and I didn't want to kill my video before I even had a chance to finish processing the title. The challenge is really whether or not I can beat the game without killing a headcrab, but seeing as I attempt to do no harm to them in the act of not killing, the title still fits. The game starts with you trying to navigate the city in order to find your dad. Instead, you find a bunch of Combine soldiers that really don't like you trying to close doors or try to grab their guns. I accidentally exposed myself as a button enthusiast and a large soldier decided to kink shame me with the shocky stick. I woke up in the back of a van, but this time instead of the neighborhood kitty diddler Larry, I saw that two combine soldiers were driving me to who knows where. I never got to find out where we were going because the drone with a grenade decided to test how fast the van could go from operational to laying on its side with two dead combine soldiers in the front seats. The drone offered me an Xbox 360 party chat headset and then kink shaped me for trying to finger blast the outside of the van. It was quickly sent to kink shame jail and I went on to meet Russell. Russell comes off as a funny and kind character, but much like Hannibal Lecter, it only takes a quick trip to his fridge to discover that he's actually a giant asshole. I tried to make him confess to his crimes against head crab kind, but I was distracted when I saw a fourth wall break sitting behind him. I went into the next room and committed a little bit of hand masochism to get the gravity gloves, which ended up coming from two microwaves rotated on their sides. When I went outside to test them out, Russell tried to reenact that shot from the trailers, but just ended up shooting me in the ankle. It's unloaded now! The pain ended up being worth it though, because I traded a perfectly good pistol for a worthless Achilles tendon. While I was messing around with the gravity gloves, I found a familiar face passed out on a couch. Instead of putting him in a rocket, I took him with me on the midnight train going who knows where. I tried to wake up a guy who had obviously attended the same party as my buddy, but he was thoroughly lost in the sauce. I tossed my gnome friend away in order to have a free hand to pick up more useful things, such as Half-Life Alex's form of currency, resin. After committing another act of hand masochism and injecting my hands with alien bug juice, I tried to wake up a kind gentleman to inform him of the fact that his lungs were exposed to the outside world. I was distracted when I spotted the gnome resting in the mud and decided to send him where he belongs, in a pit of human mud. One puzzle later, I was opening the vault door to the quarantined portion of the city and practicing my favorite pastime since puberty on a weird fungal growth. I then encountered the first headcrab of the game. Yeah, that Unfortunately, it was stuck on a zombie. Our reunion was cut short by a barnacle that had other plans for the little guy, so I had to save scum my way back and kill the barnacle before he could reenact that one Newgrounds video with Raven and Starfire from the early 2000s. You know the one. Now's a good time to explain a part of this challenge that requires a bit of explanation. In my mind, headcrabs resting on zombies' heads are the Schrodinger's cat of the Half-Life universe. I don't know if they are alive or dead until I free them from their zombie hosts, so I make a point to only shoot the zombies that are underneath the headcrabs. If the headcrab pops off and doesn't start moving, it was dead before I encountered it and there was nothing I could do. If it pops off and is alive, I successfully freed it from a lifetime of protecting a zombie from UV rays. I tried to upgrade a headcrab at a weapons upgrade station, but it was perfect just the way it was and opted to take a nap instead. After using a propane tank and my pistol to free a few more headcrabs from their parasitic hosts, I encountered the first living headcrab in the game. Headcrab! I see it! The game clearly expects you to kill the two headcrabs in this area, but you can easily walk past them into the loading area right behind them. I met a new friend while trying to search an office for resin and came across a very creepy floating green eye. 
Behind the eye, I found two head crabs that had clearly tried pole vaulting without knowing the proper techniques, and a bunch of alien graffiti. After freeing some more cardboard and completing the puzzle that totally didn't take me 20 minutes to figure out the first time I played through the game, I entered a hallway that had very sinister vibes. The head crab stuck in a cage was a bad omen, but before I was able to get Pete on the phone, I found myself in a hallway that somehow reminded me of the one from Event Horizon. After ringing the dinner bell, I met my personal favorite character of the game. Oh. The Alex Vance. Unfortunately, in the context of this video, he's pretty much one of the most evil bastards I've ever had the misfortune of encountering. It doesn't take long to realize that the head crabs in cages and hanging from hooks in his home aren't there for aesthetic purposes. The only positive aspect of this area is the amazing animation work on display, but it's easily overshadowed by the atrocious treatment of head crabs. After showing me his figurine collection and going on a rant about how Israel is not a legitimate state, the Gorgonite decided to taunt me one last time with the corpse of a precious head crab. I'll eat it later. Fortunately, it didn't take long for me to encounter a living head crab, and an armored one at that. I took special care to avoid shooting one of the head crab's weird glowing eye belly thing and dodged my way past them to get to the battery for the next area. <sighs> Two of the little guys ended up in a hole in the ground, and I found myself face to face with my favorite weapon in the game, the shotgun. The shotgun is the perfect weapon for freeing head crabs from the zombies underneath them in one swift shot. The next area was a pain in the ass to navigate. I wanted to get the head crabs into a lower portion of the hallway in order to get uninterrupted access to the weapon upgrade station down the hall. This meant baiting seven head crabs into following me and falling down into a lower portion of the hallway. I died a few times trying to do so, and every time I thought I had baited every head crab in the area, a new one would show up. Eventually, I successfully upgraded my pistol with the bullet reservoir, an upgrade that allows you to hold twice the amount of bullets without having to reload. After watching one head crab shake what his head grab mama gave him, and getting startled by another that blended in with empty shells on the ground, I quickly hopped through an unnecessarily dark room to get the flashlight. Whew. It, is dark. it was in this chamber that I met the only head crab variation that this game couldn't have made cute if it tried the poison head crab. Luckily, I got a break from dealing with head crabs in the next section where I met a man hack in a hallway, which sounds like a sick metal band name, and ran into the aftermath of what looked like a badass rave that had gotten interrupted by some angry bionicles. But I wrote bionicles. I meant to say barnacles, but I wrote bionicles. I'm keeping it in. Anyways, I found myself in an area that really only serves to remind you over and over that red things in video games usually explode. After narrowly missing a flying propane tank, I was able to take a brief stint above ground and enjoy the fresh air and horizon that reminded me of the city of Dunwall from Dishonored before hacking into a console and fixing it with a gross meat circle thing. After breaking off a handle, I had to hold a lever to let a train go down the wrong track. A few minutes later, I happened upon my dad just hanging around waiting for me to give him a hand, but I was too late and he died, severing the storyline for the Half-Life series. Just kidding, he was actually saved by alien voodoo magic. I recreated that one shot from Valve's Twitter teaser and found myself looking at the vault that the whole game is centered on getting to. I avoided harming and getting harmed by three head crabs with a handy drawer and took the elevator downstairs. While I watched a poisonous head crab do his thing, I tried desperately to find a redeeming quality about him, but there was nothing to find. Then I freed a head crab from a zombie with just an eensy teensy tiny bit of explosions and encountered one of the first new enemy varieties introduced to the Half-Life series in over a decade. Before I could get a closer look at it, I took in a room that reminded me heavily of an environment that could have easily been pulled straight out of The Last of Us. The zombie corpse in the next room covered in alien fungus added further to the illusion that I was actually in The Last of Us, but fortunately this wasn't The Last of Us 2. I did my part in reversing the damage done to the earth by the combine and rubbed an alien's belly to more easily grab his balls. 
The next section of the game represented the first real roadblock in this video's challenge in the form of this guy. I thought he was a new form of head crab the first time I played through the game, but when I encountered him in this playthrough, I was met with a difficult decision. On the one hand, if he is a head crab, I can't continue this challenge because you need to kill him in order to progress through the story. However, I think the challenge lives on because for all intents and purposes, whatever this thing is, it's closer to a dog than a head crab. No other head crab variants have tails, and every other head crab tries to jump on your face and stay there. This guy has teeth that are much more like the mouth of a dog, or cat, and shoots lightning out of its stomach. Needless to say, I decided that he wasn't a head crab and elected to put it out of its misery. I didn't feel any better putting a cool blue alien dog thing down, but doing so meant that I could continue on with this video's challenge. I got a brief look back up at the sunlight and some much needed vitamin D before I delved even further into the bowels of the city. I encountered some poisonous head crabs that used clever distracting tactics to lure me into a closet and came face to face with an armored head crab that turned out to respond positively to threats of force. Who would have thought? I encountered another one of the things that I will henceforth refer to as Sparkies and watched him do the opposite of what the prepubescent aliens did in the alien movies. After watching him change his mind over what side of the zombie's chest he wanted to be on, I put him out of his misery and went on to call the elevator down. I upgraded my shotgun by adding a grenade launcher attachment, baited a poisonous head crab past me, thought he was a fool until I nearly killed myself by using the aforementioned grenade launcher on a zombie only a few feet away, and proved myself the fool. I shimmied along an edge that totally didn't play on my fear of heights, and stumbled on a cool bit of environmental storytelling. Three zombies were trying desperately to get out of a room with a boarded up door. I helped them get over their obstacle with a free grenade and discovered the source of their panic. Another one of the zombies must have had a serious BM to keep it on the toilet even after death. I found an unbound combine rifle and enjoyed the cool reload animation and went on to see if I could shut down the power from the relay to the vault. I freed a Vortigaunt and made an easy shot in one try. I watched a headcrab bump his cute little head and plummet down a non-lethal distance and stumbled on another trying to explore his feelings for a mannequin. Not wanting to be one to kink shame, I made sure to reunite him with his mannequin GF and continued on my merry way. It wasn't until I saw the scene with the sun on the horizon and the gorgeous city landscape sprawled out in front of me that I remember just how beautiful this game was. Then I dodged a headcrab's futile attempts at turning my head into its next perch and checked to see how my leg crops were doing. The harvest will be plentiful this year. A zombie generously cleared the way of mines for me and I reminded a combine soldier as to why it's a bad idea to keep explosive barrels of propane on your back. This challenge was relatively easy up to this point but this poisonous head crab turned out to be a real pain in the ass. For some reason or another, it was born without a sense of self-preservation. The first time I encountered it, it jumped into the tentacle of a barnacle and was promptly chewed to a pulp by the time I tried to free it. The second time I attempted to save it from dying to the barnacle, it was caught, but I killed the barnacle before it had a chance to munch on the four-legged friend. After safe scumming one more time, I was able to shoot the lock, distract the barnacle, race to the door, and kill the tentacled bastard before he was able to give the headcrab another lethal poke. In an act of appreciation, the headcrab tried to jump on my face and kill me. This footage doesn't quite do the fear I felt justice when I was jump scared by Russell's drone, but it worked out in the end when a combine soldier got revenge on my behalf. I added an auto loader to my shotgun and happened upon a combine scientist that had evidently gotten absolutely lost in the sauce. I got to enjoy one more beautiful look at the skyline before I started one of my favorite chapters of any video game ever, Jeff. I'll also take this opportunity to gush over the character animation one last time in this video. Take a few seconds to appreciate how Valve made every NPC in this game look and sound like they were really there in front of you. You don't happen to have a gun on you, do you? Well, yeah, look at that. It's a, it's a nice one too. It's nicer than mine, which is up inside this guy. The effect is even more convincing in VR. Larry introduced me to Jeff by wasting a perfectly good bottle of vodka, and we parted ways, but not before I was able to appreciate his stylish hat. It wasn't until my third playthrough of the game that I realized that all the nails and screws on the top of his hat were to keep barnacles from grabbing him. I then started Jeff's section of the game. This entire encounter is one of the most perfect executions of suspense, dread, and misdirection that has ever been implemented into a video game. 
and the horror was expounded upon by Jeff's treatment of this poor headcrab. The initial horror from my first time playing through this section had waned considerably, but I was still able to appreciate the way the game designers made me get close to Jeff for one reason or another, despite every attempt I made to distance myself from him. Unfortunately, just as I got caught up in appreciating one of the coolest enemies in the past decade of gaming, Jeff had to go and cement himself as a headcrab hater, and thusly, my enemy. I got some catharsis in the form of finding a headcrab safely in event before teasing Jeff and luring him into a trash compactor. I got vengeance for the countless headcrabs lost to Jeff's vile goop, but I didn't spend much time gloating. One giant door opening and creepy hole in the ground later, I was upgrading my combine rifle one last time and moving on to the next portion of the game. This part of the game in Oddwards is plenty interesting and fun in a normal playthrough, but for the purposes of this challenge, it is not. That's because, from this point on, interactions with headcrabs become fewer and farther between. After my first time through, I also find this part of the game much less interesting because most of the combat takes place against antlions. Antlions look cool, don't get me wrong, and their animations and behavior are a definite step up from previous Half-Life titles, but fighting them feels like the only gamey portion of Half-Life Alex. You shoot the glowing parts until they die. Once you've fought one antlion, you've fought them all. Despite my disappointment in the antlion behavior, the game still had a few pleasant surprises for me. This headcrab helped me back up my claim that headcrabs are secretly adorable, harmless little creatures that want to protect our scalps from harmful UV rays. This headcrab I found also reinforced the idea that headcrabs are really only a threat to themselves. As the game progressed, I discovered something that encouraged me to continue with the challenge. It was as if the headcrabs could pick up on the fact that I meant them no harm. I found that they became less and less hostile as the game went on. This was evidenced by the fact that this headcrab tried to give me a hug. After denying him and his friends advances, I found and climbed a beautiful ladder leading up to the surface and disposed of a combine soldier with one swift, clean shot. As I neared the end of the game, I found that the environments got more impressive as time went on, and watching the vault falling only to get caught by some sort of combine tractor beam, I was reminded that I was playing a new Half-Life game. Who would have thought? I totally marked two combine soldiers after making sure the grenade launcher wasn't primed, and then died to a trip mine that totally shouldn't have been set off. I outsmarted the lasers with the bucket and encountered a familiar problem. I had to kill a barnacle before it got the chance to get its grubby paws or tentacle or whatever on a headcrab, caught a grenade out of midair like a total badass, and found myself face to face with the vault. I had gotten different vibes from plenty of areas in the game, and this area totally reminded me of the cities featured in Dying Light. I found the controls that needed to be used to bring the vault down and totally didn't mess everything up. No, not that one! No, Russ, I can see it not moving. And then it happened. I encountered the last living headcrab in the game. I didn't know at the time that he was the last, but something told me that he would be at least one of the last. If I'd known he would be the last living headcrab I would encounter in the run, I would have let him jump on my face one last time. After leaving him behind, I encountered one of the more tame enemies in the Half-Life series, defeated him easily, and started the end of the game. From this point onwards, I had very little to do but walk through the vault and enjoy the sights. I came across one of the viruses Jimmy Neutron fought in that one episode, bullied a ghost, and encountered gravity that was messed up in all kinds of ways. I also encountered the last headcrab of the game, only this time it was a dead poison headcrab. The vault messed with my head a few more times with a few more assaults on gravity, and then stole my loaf of bread. Fortunately, I got to enact my revenge for every loaf of bread lost to the Combine when they invaded Earth, and found myself freeing who I originally thought was going to be Gordon Freeman. And with that, 
I successfully completed Half-Life Alex without hurting or killing a single headcrab.